Oh, oh time. Everybody's in place. Clear. <coughs> Clear. 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 O fusnes heddiw yw enwebu prif wynidog o dan real sefydlog oeth. A oes i ni o enwebiadau a gyfer penodi prif wynidog? I nominate Vaughan Gethin. A oes i ni o enwebiadau eraith? Andrew Artie Davis. A oes i ni o enwebiadau eraith? Dip Lywydd Enwebaf, I nominate Rhynap Iorwerth. No others? <laughs> Gan fod tri in webiad. Gan fod tri in webiad. Bydd yn cynnal plai gleis drwy alwg gofrestra ac yn gwahodd pob aelod sy'n presennol i blai gleisio dros amgeisedd. Bydd yn galw pob aelod sy'n presennol yn refn y uh, oeddo a dywedwch am enw amgeisedd rydych yn anau gyfnogi yn glir pan gwych eich galw neu dwedwch yn glir eich bod yn dymuno ymadal. Yn un o'r reol sefydlog 8.2, chlywydd a fi na minnau bleidleisio. Right. Let's start. Mick Antonev. Vaughan Gethin. Mabra Gwymfo. Rhyn a Piorwerth. Rhyn a Piorwerth. Rhyn a Piorwerth. Natasha Asker. Andrew Artie Davis. Anna Blythyn. Vaughan Gethin. Dawn Bowden. Vaughan Gethin. Jane Bryant. Vaughan Gethin. Kevin Campbell. Rhyn a Piorwerth. Kevin David. Vaughan Gethin. Alan Davis. Vaughan Gethin. Andrew Arty Davis. Andrew Arty Davis. <laughs> Gareth Davis. Andrew Arty Davis. Paul Davis. Andrew Arty Davis. Jane Dodds. Paul Gething. Mark Drakeford. Paul Gething. James Evans is absent. Rebecca Evans. Paul Gething. Jonathan Saunders. Andrew Arty Davis. <laughs> Luke Fletcher. Reen up your wealth. Peter Fox. Andrew Arty Davis. Helen Buchan. Reen up your wealth. Russell George is absent. Vaughan Gethin. Vaughan Gethin. Tom Gifford. Andrew R.T. Davis. John Griffiths. Vaughan Gethin. Leslie Griffiths. Vaughan Gethin. Lee Griffiths. Lee Napiorwerth. Sean Gwentlian. Lee Napiorwerth. Mike Hedges. Uh, Vaughan Gethin. Vicky Howells. Vaughan Gethin. Alta Hussein. Andrew R.T. Davis. Jane Hutt. Vaughan Gethin. Hugh Ranker Davis. Gethin. Mark Isherwood. Andrew R. T. Davis. Joel James. Andrew R. T. Davis. Julie James. Gethin. Delith Jewel. Laura Ann Jones. Andrew R. T. Davis. Samuel Kurtz. Andrew R. T. Davis. Jeremy Miles. Darren Miller is absent. Leonard Morgan. Julie Morgan. Sarah Murphy. Gethin. Lynn Eagle. Born Gethin. Breda Owen Griffiths. Piorwerth. Lena Pasmo is absent. Adam Price. Rina Piorwerth. Jenny Rathbone is absent. Sam Rowlands. Davis. Jack Sargent. Born Gethin. Ken Skates. Born Gethin. Colin Thomas. Born Gethin. Lee Waters. Born Gethin. <laughs> Joyce Watson. Born Gethin. Buffy Williams. Is absent. Sean Williams. Sean Williams. And I'm going to. I think I missed out Mark Drakeford. No. Didn't I? Oh, I did have it, yes. Yeah. But then I want an hour to check Gadan High can Linyad a blood lice. You can ask, but you won't get. <laughs> Not unless there are figures.
I don't believe the numbers are doing. Right. Okay, Trevon. Um Dana Damagin Ladia a blight I can Haldwid Joy Alugovestra. I vectly that can board Vaughan Gethin with the Kyle and Webby Eu Benodin Brevenid of Gamre. And you know that I'd run forty seven, is that? Yeah. Ah, right, okay. Just checking. Then section is forty seven four of the Governor of Wales Act. I wasn't sure. I will now recommend to His Majesty the appointment of Vaughan Gethin as First Minister, and I invite Vaughan Gethin to address the Senate. Jock, Dippy Thoroth, a Jock, I lod, I see where they kept Noggy, where and Webiad had you. My sincere thanks to fellow members who have supported my nomination today. <clears throat> I am particularly grateful to my predecessor, Mark Drakeford, for his nomination and for the support that he has offered me, not just in recent days, but through the many years that we have worked so closely together. I don't think any of us would ever want to live through those dark days of the pandemic again. But, like other colleagues here, I was incredibly grateful to have Mark as our First Minister through that time. History will rightly judge Mark for the compassionate, collegiate and ethical leadership that shone through those dark days for our nation. It is said that no legacy is so rich as honesty. Mark's leadership is characterised by those words. Yesterday's contribution placed that firmly on the record once more. So can I today once again say Diolch and Vau, Mark, for everything that you have done for Wales. During Mark's contribution following his election, nomination as First Minister, he recalled how on difficult days, Rodri Morgan would utter the words, tin hat on, moments before heading into First Minister's questions. This was in December 2018, and I remember Mark asking his watching family to make sure that Father Christmas would deliver him a tin hat that year. <laughs> so to my relatives watching on today, I'd really rather not wait until Christmas. <laughs> Sometime in the next three weeks would be ideal. But Dippershlower, as we look back at those stories of the people who have shaped devolution in its first quarter century, it is striking that there are now growing numbers of people here in Wales who have never known a time without it. In my slightly misspent youth, I included some time campaigning in the Yes for Wales movement that helped to win the referendum that made days like today possible. For a growing number of members in this chamber, devolution, Welsh solutions, Welsh problems and opportunities, has been a constant feature of our adult lives. In recent years, we have pushed the boundaries of what is possible with devolution. We did it, for example, to keep Wales safe. But in that same period, we have seen unprecedented hostility towards democratic Welsh devolution from a UK government that is determined to undermine, frustrate and bypass the Welsh Government and this Senate. As well as leaving Wales with less say over less money, it is deeply corrosive, wasteful and undemocratic. As First Minister, I look forward to standing up for Wales and for devolution in the weeks and months to come. But I relish the opportunity to cooperate for Wales with a new UK government that invests in partnership and in Wales's future. I relish it because, like so many members and friends here today, I want Wales to thrive in the sunshine that hope and social justice can offer all of us, no matter what our background, what we look like, or who we love. My Cymru and Haley, Moynag, a Spadei, Haylock. 
From sunny intervals, where hope too often feels hard to find, we can embrace fresh optimism and new ambition for a fairer Wales built by all of us. Deputy Lowerth, I have spoken in recent days about my determination to offer a listening ear and the hand of friendship to anyone in this Senate and beyond where we share that ambition for our country's future. Delivering on the needs of the people of Wales requires collective commitment to listening. In the face of new forces of division, restoring trust and recovering dignity in the way that we speak to one another is more important than ever. Those who seek to amplify nasty populism are hungry for a disunited Wales. Our task, I believe, is to prevent the victory of division and hate by building bridges, by listening, by recreating a bond of trust between people and power. These are the ingredients of a kinder and more effective politics, one where we overcome the ruthless efforts to make our warm nation turn cold. As First Minister, I will bring together a government that constantly makes the positive case for progressive politics, to remind people that only through coming together can we achieve for the many. So I choose to make a stand for positivity, to never fan the flames that are hurtful to people and damage our standing in the world. To stand for a set of ideas and policy innovations that are rooted in Welsh values. To stand for a leadership grounded not in bitterness, resentment, or the fruitless search for a past that never was, but a leadership based on hope to advance the case for human rights, for solidarity, and for a commitment to play a collective international role in addressing the challenges that we face. Deputy Lord, I cannot bless this election nomination pass without saying something about its historic significance. I am, after all, the first elected leader of my party and, indeed, my country, with an app in their name. We have, of course, today voted also <laughs> to ensure that Wales becomes the first nation anywhere in Europe to be led by a black person. It is a matter of pride, I believe, for a modern Wales, but also a daunting responsibility for me, and one that I do not take lightly. But today, we can also expect a depressingly familiar pattern to emerge with abuse on social media, racist tropes disguised with polite language, people questioning my motives, and yes, they will still question or deny my nationality, whilst others will question why I am playing the race card. To those people, I say once more, it is very easy not to care about identity when your own has never once been questioned or held you back. <laughs> I believe the Wales of today and the future will be owned by all those decent people who recognise that our Parliament and our Government should look like our country. People who recognise that our hope and ambition for the future relies on unleashing the talent of all of us. A Wales that recognises that we can celebrate our differences and take pride in all those things that draw us together and make us who we are. That is the Wales that I want to lead, a Wales full of hope, ambition, and unity. Give them their five And Vaughan, may I wish you all the best in your new role as First Minister of this Senate and of Wales. Good luck.
but for clarity purposes, I now wish to record the votes. There were 51 votes cast, 27 in favour of Vaughan Gethin, 13 in favour of Andrew R.T. Davis, and 11 in favour of Greenup Yorworth, with no abstentions. Thank you. Right, Nesaf, you question I am Cyril. Ac my question, Gunter Gan Jane Dodds. Would the Minister make a statement on the child practice review into the death of Kalia Titfords? Um, I thank um, the member for that uh, question. Uh, Kaylee very sadly died just after her 16th birthday in tragic circumstances, and her parents were convicted of her manslaughter and are now in prison. The Child Practice Review will help us learn what more we can do to improve multi-agency safeguarding practice to protect children and young people. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Dechenbaur Amaramatab. I know how committed you are to children and young people and to their protection. Um, I just really want to say a few words about Kalia because it's so uh, difficult in these circumstances to often remember that there is a child here who has died. Kalia was 16. She was described as wonderful, fun, determined and headstrong. And I do like this. She would not accept dietary advice when delivered in a condescending way. I think we can all relate to that, can't we? However, sadly, Kalia died aged uh, 16 at, at 22 stone, and the conditions that she died in, when found, were described as being unfit for an animal. We must never forget that the people responsible for this, as you quite rightly say, Minister, were her parents. However, there are two elements here which I would like to raise. The first is one which I've raised before, which is about multi-agency working, which failed Kaylea and also failed another child who died in Wales, Logan Mwangi. Multi-agency working is something that is so important, and yet, because the agencies didn't communicate well, they lost track of her. And it's really important that we learn from this, uh, this lack of multi-agency focus. But the second one is around the child practice review, and this is a systemic issue. Um, it's about the governance. Who is responsible for monitoring the actions from child practice reviews? We know that there is a new process that is being developed called a single unified safeguarding review, which should be starting next month, April 2024. But there are no details available for that. Now, if we are to keep children and young people across Wales safe, we have to have a process which ensures there is responsibility for not only learning from those actions and holding people to account for them, but also to ensure that we absolutely move those forward to ensure that people like Kelia don't die in these circumstances again. So I would like to ask you, Minister, how are you and the government uh, going to ensure that we have better multi-agency working and that we have a system which meets the needs of <coughs> these very vulnerable children and young people? Um, thank you, um, uh, Jane. And I think we do all remember we are talking about a tragedy today where a young woman died just days after her 16th birthday. And I think it's very important that we respect in our, you know, in our debates today the fact that a unique life has been lost. And we must approach our discussion here sensitively. Um, as you said, Jane, uh, Kayleigh's parents have been convicted of manslaughter by gross negligence and are serving long prison sentences, and they bear the responsibility uh, for her death. Um, and I think it's um, important for the uh, Senate to hear about the, what the judge said during sentencing of this case. He said, help was there for the taking. It was there for the asking. It had been given before. The failure to get any help at all, even from her GP, was particularly significant in the crucial lockdown months leading to her death. And we do know that the COVID-19 um, <laughs> pandemic did exacerbate her isolation, um, and this reduced opportunities for help to be made available to the family. But I don't think it's clear how much, if any, of this help would have been taken up. 
Um, but you rightly identify the importance of multi-agency um, working. Um, and the learning identified from the reviews is shared currently via several routes. Um, regional safeguarding board uh, meetings comprising key stakeholders, board websites, briefings, and is used to inform multi-agency training across the region. And since the sad death of the other child that you referred to, there have been, you know, advances have been made in terms of that um, working. And we do have our current programme of work to develop a single unified safeguarding re review, including the development of a repository of child practice reviews, which will also include adult practice reviews and other safeguarding reviews. And this will further strengthen our ability nationally to learn from and address recommendations from safeguarding reviews as part of the continuous improvement of multi-agency practice. I mean, what we must do is learn from each unique set of, of circumstances, improve interagency working and information exchange, and we must improve the skill base and decision making of those on this front line. I think that is absolutely crucial, and that's why um, we have a practice framework that we have introduced as part of our transformation of children's services. And I think all the things that we are doing in that transformation agenda um, will help address um, these issues. Um, but basically, I want to say, you know, my greater sympathies to her family and that we, you know, need to approach this very sensitively. Davis. Bill Flow with uh, Dross Drone. I'd just like to put on record um, my sadness at, um, at, at this event. And I'm aware that it's not the first time that this has been raised in the Senate than holding the social services um, portfolio for the Welsh Conservatives. I've seen um, firsthand this is, that this is not the only case um, that we've seen in Wales. Um, we've seen the, the, the case of Kalia Titford um, that we're speaking about now, and also uh, Logan Mwangi, which we've also discussed um, in this Senate chamber to um, a, fair, um, a fair degree, shall we say. Um, with Kalia Titford, Logan Mwangi, um, there's, a, there's a theme developing here, isn't there, Deputy Minister? And I've long called for, and my party has have called for, um, a Wales-wide uh, review of children's services across the 22 local authorities to encompass um, all of these issues that we're speaking about today, um, to make sure that no child um, slips through the net um, here um, in Wales and that we're giving the local authorities all the opportunity to have the chance to, um, uh, to, to address these, um, these concerns and stop um, any potential future cases um, occurring in Wales. Now, um, obviously, we've just um, elected a new First Minister of Wales. Um, I'm not sure um, whether, you'll be the, um, whether you'll be the holder of the post in the future or it'll be a potential successor, but will you commit um, your role now or, or your potential successor's role in, in, in conducting a Wales-wide um, review of children's services? Because I believe that um, Wales is the only outlier in this situation because the Scottish Government, the UK Government um, for, for, for England have, um, have commissioned um, uh, nationwide reviews of their uh, children's services. So why should Wales be the only outlier in this situation? We can talk about policy boards, we can talk about frameworks um, and, and, all the, um, and all the safeguards in place that currently exist. But what's wrong with having a, a nationwide review um, just uh, and in line with um, what Scotland um, and England have, um, have, already, have already done? Um, you know, I, I look at these cases and, you know, they're, they're, they're tragic and we know that the people um, who, have, um, who have carried out this neglect are, are suffering, uh, are, are facing justice um, as, they, as they currently are. Um, but what's wrong with having a Wales-wide review just to make sure that no child slips through the net in Wales and we can indeed um, try our best to stop any um, future cases developing um, um, such as this and the Logan Mwangi case that we saw in Bridge End? Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Gareth, for that uh, contribution um, and for your condolences about this um, awful situation. Um, I would like to point out um, to you, Gareth, that the many of the issues um, in this case are related to health um, because of, you know, I I'm sure you're aware that Kayleigh did have um, specific um, health problems. And to have a review of children's services 
um, a, a Wales-wide review of children's services would not adequately address the issues that we've been talking about um, and the health issues that have been raised uh, in relation to this case are actually uh, things that we are making considerable progress on since uh, Kayleigh sadly died in relation to um, weight uh, management and, in, and, and also our transformation programme. Um, so we have undertaken several reviews and when I talked about the tragic death of Logan, I listed at length the number of reviews that we've had in Wales looking at these issues. And in October 22, um, we asked Care Inspectorate Wales to lead on a multi-agency rapid review of decision-making in relation to child protection. And this report identified, uh, you know, both areas of good practice and areas where learning uh, can take place. And that's been considered as part of our transformation agenda. So we're certainly prepared um, to do reviews and have done many reviews. Um, but our commitment to address these issues is, 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 is absolutely paramount. And I think it's also important um, you know, to note that uh, we do actually anticipate um, in 2024 an increase in the number of child practice reviews that are published um, because information from regional safeguarding boards confirms that this is linked with the fact that child practice reviews were delayed and paused between 2020 and 2022 because of the pandemic. And this is um, you know, the demands that they were on multi-agency services during the pandemic meant that these child practice reviews um, didn't take place and haven't been published. Um, so we anticipate there being some more of those appearing um, now. Um, but, uh, you know, each one, as I've said before, I think we have to treat individually, take on board the learning from those, uh, from those reviews and, and work to make a system where these events are less likely to happen. Sean Edmund. Um, Kelly was disabled. She had spina bifida and used a wheelchair. Those health problems that you mentioned. And the report of the child practice review into her death, to a tragic death, um, said there was no assessment of the likelihood she could suffer significant harm during the pandemic. It, and I quote, the evidence of the way she died permits us to conclude the contributory impact of extended quarantine was multiple and complex, exacerbating her vulnerabilities and reducing the support infrastructure upon which she relied. This awful case really highlights how disabled people's rights were neglected and denied during the pandemic. And this came out very strongly in the evidence of disabled people's organisations to the UK COVID inquiry when it sat in Wales over the last weeks. So does the government acknowledge their responsibility, therefore, in the resulting suffering that occurred as a result of its conscious suspicion suspension of disabled people's rights? How, how can it demonstrate that lessons have been learnt for the future? And what reassurances can the government provide us in light of the financial constraints to this year's budget, that social services are sufficiently resourced to ensure all of our citizens are properly cared for and safeguarded? Um, thank you, Charlotte, for those um, uh, comments. And um, certainly, I think we do accept that um, you know, disabled people did suffer um, during the pandemic. Um, and uh, disabled people's rights are something that we're obviously very concerned about and want uh, to address. I think reading through the report, I think there were some ways in which great efforts were made before this tragic series of circumstances happened for Kayleigh to live a very full um, life. And I'm sure um, you read about the... Uh, the contact that was made with her continu you know, continuously during the pandemic from the school. Um, but um, there's no doubt that the fact that um, she was isolated there um, was uh, not able to attend a hub. So uh, I think people in the neighbourhood noticed that she wasn't around, but then that was COVID, so they didn't expect her to be around. So I think there were circumstances that meant the um, awful circumstances that were occurring weren't known to people and weren't um, noticed. But in terms of addressing the um, issues um, that you raised, which are health issues, um, about the, um, you know, the fact that she suffered from spina bifida, where there is undoubtedly an issue related to weight, and it's really important that weight um, is uh, controlled and monitored. 
In 2021, we published the All Wales Weight Management Pathway for Children, Young People and Families. And the underlying pinning principles of the pathway are that it's person-centred and proportionate to need. And this pathway provides the opportunity for a multidisciplinary team to be created in health that would regularly assess and review needs in relation to weight management. And um, I think it's important to make the point that um, since um, Kayleigh's um, terrible death, um, we have uh, made progress in terms of the weight management, which is so important. And also, there were um, many uh, missed appointments um, in Kayleigh's um, life, and the health service's response to missed appointments in Kayleigh's case is being addressed in the NHS National Safeguarding Services Action Plan. I mean, I think we've just got to do everything we can um, to reduce the risks um, to children and, you know, to disabled children and to protect them from harm. But, I mean, sadly, we cannot entirely um, elim eliminate the risks. Um, and I think, you know, sadly, we cannot prevent child homicide altogether, but we just got to do our utmost. And I think she makes a really important point about uh, disabled children and what we must do about them. Uh, what discussions has the Welsh Government had with Tata following the announcement to close the Coke Gardens at Patolmac? Do I have a question? Following Monday's announcement, I discussed the matter with the Tata Steel UK Chief Executive on the same day. This is obviously deeply disappointing news. However, we have regularly been made aware by the company and trade unions of the concerns over the operational safety of the coke ovens. Clearly, operational safety matters for workers <coughs> must take precedence. Can I thank the First Minister-elect for that answer? Um, to me, I drive home from this place regularly every night. I pass the coke ovens. It will be something to see them not work anymore. But to me, that is something I will see. But to the workers in those coke ovens and to the workers across the heavy end of the plant, there will be huge anxiety and worry about their futures. And their families will worry. And the wider community will worry. Because what has the knock-on effect of all these closures? And this happens when the statutory consultation process has not yet completed that the trade union negotiations with the TAT themselves about what they can do to support workers for redeployment, or maybe those who actually may find themselves redundant, has not yet concluded. So there's still much, what I call, in the ether yet, because decisions haven't been made, and anxieties are going to rise, and we are going to have serious concerns over the future. So whilst I welcome the answer yesterday given by the then First Minister regarding the additional funding to support workers to train and reskill and gain those qualifications so they can move into new opportunities. There is still much to be done for many, many workers that are still employed by Tata. So what plans have you managed to prepare to support workers into new employment? Perhaps even look at mechanisms to share and match funding job opportunities in businesses across the region. And what opportunities have you identified for bringing new job opportunities into the region so that those who may find themselves no longer employed by TAT, and that includes the contractors and the supply workforce, they're going to be just as badly affected so they can move into work more quickly. Because this decision has accelerated the announcement for January 19th. The heavy end was due to partly close at the end of January, at the end of June, totally at the end of this year. We are months away from that, and we are now seeing coke ovens shutting down today, actually, and Blast Furnace 5 depended upon importing coke if they can actually acquire it, and then Blast Furnace 4 possibly being coming down at the end of October. So it is important we now get action to ensure that those, those workers, those families, the communities that they live in, are actually reassured that we are looking after them in the future. Thank you for the comments and the questions. And I think there are two distinct parts of this. There's the immediate impact of the coke oven closure, and there's the wider challenge over the plans that Tata have for the future and the potential consequence of those. And I understand why people will be anxious about both of those. So in the conversation we've had with 
Tata, they've been clear that the current workforce around the Coke Commons will be gainfully employed for some time to come. The challenge comes in the consultation that is still ongoing and not completed about how long term that is, what sort of redeployment uh, is available. There's the safe shutdown of the Coke Commons as well. It's not something where you can simply flick a switch uh, and it's safely shut down. It's quite a complex uh, engineering challenge to safely decommission. And there is then the challenge about that broader piece. So actually we've been clear in our conversation with both trade unions and the company that there is enough coke available to maintain the blast furnaces um, to the current um, plan that Tata have. Uh, so that doesn't um, risk uh, the blast furnace 4 uh, and its ability to operate into the autumn. They will now need to acquire more coke, so that should be helpful. The second part around what may happen now is complicated because there is an unfinished uh, set of negotiations that are taking place. So we are looking, of course, uh, at the wider economy and what the current opportunities are for the direct workforce and for contractors and for potentially the indirectly affected group of workers. That is both about employment that exists within the wider market as well as potential for new jobs. Um, part of the reason why we have talked about the timing for any changes is that the opportunity to bring in new employment of a commensurate level, bearing in mind the wages that workers at Tata and contractors have, uh, is part of our anxiety about the pace of any change. Uh, for this particular set of workers, and there are potentially hundreds of jobs affected as part of the consultation, uh, that's an easier challenge to manage. There are still a number of workers who have decent work available, but it's actually whether the reskilling and retraining can take place. I'm confident we can provide within our current budgets uh, support for that to happen, and that we can coordinate that both with Job Centre Plus, if required, if there are people leaving the workforce, uh, and indeed with the local authority as well. Uh, the larger challenge still remains about the wider set of negotiations that are taking place at the moment. If there are people who wish to leave on voluntary terms, what those terms might be, but actually the end result of the ongoing uh, negotiation. We won't know that um, in the next week or two. So um, this isn't going to be something that's going to be dealt with in a matter of the initial 45 days. It'll take longer than that. So I can't give the member a definitive view on future employment. I can't give the member a definitive view on the current position because none of those conversations are complete. What I can give the member assurance of is that if this group of workers find themselves unemployed, there is support available from the Welsh Government and partners and an ongoing commitment from the Government I expect to lead on making sure we carry on making the case, making the argument for the best transition possible both for workers, the wider economy, and indeed our own climate ambitions. Alta Hussein. Diak, uh, the uh, Minister, while this news is a huge blow for the workforce, their families, and the entire community, it is not unexpected. I recall meeting with the directors of Tata when I was first elected in 2015 and they discussed issues around the life of the plant and talked about the need for investment. Since that time, what has the Welsh Government done to work with Tata and the UK Government to secure the longevity of steel making at Port Talbot? Well, since that time, since I came into current post as Minister for the Economy, there has been a regular dialogue with trade unions, with the company and indeed uh, with the UK Government as far as that's been possible. It is one of my genuine frustrations, and it should be a frustration for Welsh Conservatives too, that there hasn't been a more engaged conversation with successive UK Ministers. Um, we would be in a much better position, even with our differences between the Welsh Government and the UK Government, if there was more regular dialogue and a willingness to talk more openly. Um, the transition board is actually a creation to manage a decline that this whole Senate has said it doesn't want to see happen in the way that it's currently uh, outlined, proposed, and part of the negotiation that is taking place. I think we would all be in a better place if we could have had earlier access to trusted conversations. And it's worth just pointing out, the Welsh Government has never broken a confidence when it comes to a commercially sensitive conversation. We've been a better place to understand the leaves are available to the UK government and to us, but also whether we share the ultimate end ambition. Because I do think there is a healthy future for steelmaking in the UK. 
electric arc will be part of that. But actually having primary steelmaking capability is of essential sovereign importance for the UK. And the current plan risks that. And I find it hard to believe that there are Conservative members in this chamber and indeed further afield who are willing to take that risk on our future sovereign capability and the potential for green prosperity in the future with a new generation of the way our economy works. It will still require steel to make sure we can deliver. We can either make that steel here in Wales or we can import it from somewhere else with all the jobs and economic benefit that will go with it. Luke Fletcher. Diolch um, Cadeirydd, and uh, for the record, I'd just like to declare that I'm a member of one of the subgroups of the Patalbert uh, Transition Board. This, of course, is um, devastating news, and the feeling of anxiety, as has already been set out by diaries amongst the community and workforce, is palpable. And I completely understand why the Minister is unable to give detailed answers as to where we go from here. Um, but that doesn't help the anxiety um, that is felt amongst the workforce uh, and wider community. Now, of course, welcome the information we received yesterday about further investment in support packages and retraining. I haven't seen much detail, though, um, come through on that, so some detail on that would be much appreciated, because I have no doubt there's a Senev. We are committed to our mission to save the Welsh steel industry, but what we need to do now, of course, is ensure that information about what support is available trails down to the workforce and wider community. And also, as well, what does this mean, not just for that directly employed workforce, but some of those contractors as well who rely on Tata Steel uh, for their job securities? I completely agree with the Minister. Safety is paramount, but so too is assurances on livelihoods. Yeah. I think there are perhaps two or three points. The first is there will be more detailed and written statements on that additional support. Uh, the more specific circumstance around this individual group of workers uh, still relies on the conversation, the negotiation that is yet to be completed between the company and the recognised trade unions. And we need to be supportive and enabling of that, making clear that we expect, as I have done consistently, a genuinely meaningful consultation that first looks at opportunities to retain the workforce rather than looking for opportunities to downsize and shrink the workforce. So a meaningful consultation and the way in which the company engages really does matter and it helps that more members across the chamber make clear that's the common expectation, not just the government. The second point around the broader future uh, I think is one that still goes back to the wider conversation that is yet to conclude. We can and will put more resources in supporting um, workers with the transition that takes place if there is dislocation in their work. But I still think that anxiety is not something that we can remove whilst the ongoing consultation is there, while there isn't clarity about the future. But I still think there really is genuine and realistic hope for the future. It's important not to lose sight of that. So when we have the next transition board meeting next week, there will be both an update on what is taking place on this issue, I expect, but also about the broader picture too. And I have made clear in each of my meetings with the Tata leadership, I didn't just meet the, uh, last week I met the chief exec of Tata Steel UK and the week before I met the chief exec of Tata Steel UK and the, the chief exec of Tata Global from Mumbai. We're very clear about the need to ensure that there is a future for the workforce, that promises are kept to apprentices, and equally that there's a recognition of Tata's responsibility to contractors. For some of those contractors, their business will be reliant on Tata. Not a fraction of their business, but a very large part of it. Some of them may even be single suppliers. And Tata know who those contractors are. They understand what those businesses are. It's part of the point that I made in the previous transition board about understanding who they are and sharing that information sooner rather than later. So the businesses know about the potential impact, but also the Welsh Government, Job Centre Plus, and indeed the local authorities know who those businesses are, where they're located, and what potential help and support there is. Finding out that identity too late in the day could compromise the business, could compromise the viability of those businesses and have a significant impact on what they're able to do. So that is very much the conversation we're having, as you'd expect us to do. My concern isn't that we're having a reasonable conversation. I want more information as soon as possible. It is still about the choices to be made in the coming months, and in particular, whether we can maintain a final blast furnace that is still functioning through autumn this year, and the longer term future that this government is committed to advocating for and making the case for, with new investment that can only come with a change at UK level. I can all love Jack Sargent. Uh, the Ochlawif Drostro. 
Uh, the news coming from Port Talbot is extremely disappointing to Port Talbot and to steel communities uh, across Cymru. And I say to the member uh, who represents the area, shot and stands in solidarity with the workforce at Port Talbot and their families. As the Free for Needog uh, has said before, the ability to produce virgin steel is something that is vitally important to the Welsh economy, and that is reflected in UK Labour's promise £3 billion to reinvigorate the UK steel industry. I wonder if the First Minister shares my concerns that this announcement ahead of any general election undermines an incoming Labour government and their ability to invest in this important industry? And would you use your office as First Minister to urge Tata Steel to halt these plans and wait the outcome of that much needed general election? Yeah. I think it is important to remake the case for a different future and to be really clear about this government's position, in fact, the position this whole Senate took uh, in the debate we had just a few weeks ago. I constantly restate the position of the Welsh Government that we do not want um, irreversible choices made, that we want to see a blast furnace that is still running through the general election whenever it comes. Uh, and that remains our position. The challenge always is what takes place in the negotiation, what takes place with the business itself, uh, and indeed the requirements that Tata have uh, to reorder and rework the orders they have, because they know that if they lose customers, then those customers will go somewhere else and they won't come back. That's important for the business. Of course, it's crucial for the workforce as well. So there is something here about the transition time that is available, uh, and that is in the business's self-interest, but also about making the case that there is a significant additional investment. And in fact, our UK Labour colleagues have been clear that an incoming UK Labour government would make the three billion available over five years, not ten. So actually the front load of that investment is a bigger and clearer signal. And as I've said, there will be ambitions for the future of the UK and for Wales that will need more steel, not less. I am very clear, as indeed is the whole government, we want that steel to be made here in Wales as far as possible. We want the jobs that come with that and we want the opportunities that come with that wider economic infrastructure. And when we talk about green prosperity, we are very clear that steel is part of it not steel made to different standards in other parts of the world and transferred into Wales for rolling and introduction. That would be the worst economic future, and I'm very clear that is not the path that we will ever advocate. Dale, will the Minister make a statement on the impact of climate change on the transport network? Yes, thank you. We've already seen the effects of extreme weather and climate change on all our transport networks, and it's essential that we urgently take steps to prepare for the increasing risks building on some of the good work already underway. Well, thank you, Minister. And it used to be that we would only have to contend with leaves on the lines and light snow. Uh, falls on the roads, but these days they get battered by persistent and heavy storms and by heavy rainfall. Um, as somebody who appreciates and understands the climate emergency far more than most, would you agree that we need to future-proof our infrastructure, including transport infrastructure, for the challenges that we will face in the coming years? Thank you. Uh, absolutely, future-proofing is critical. We both have to adapt to the climate change we are now facing because of the carbon already emitted, as well as mitigating future emissions to stop it getting uh, worse. Uh, and to that end, I was very encouraged yesterday by Rhonda Cunard Taft's publication of its resolved, revised plans for the Llanharan Bypass, which was rejected by the Roads Review Panel, but working really constructively with Transport for Wales. They've redesigned the scheme halving its embedded carbon, avoiding all loss of ancient woodland, halving its uh, damage on uh, habitats, and producing a scheme with half the footprint and, and a lower cost to build and maintain. So that just shows that far from banning road building, we are uh, launching on a new chapter of road building where we are leading the way. And I look forward to seeing that example of Ron the Kenntaf taken up by other uh, local authorities as well. And of course, the railways are also uh, under significant strain, and the cost of dealing with our railways, which, as we know, a large number of them are on the coast, is going to be huge in the years to come. And I think it does give us some pause of thought in how we uh, design our um, ambition for the full devolution of rail to uh, 
the, the Senate and the Welsh Government, because, we, because we, let's be careful, we're taking on a massive maintenance uh, and adaptation liability. So, so a, this is going to be a far-reaching uh, issue in the years to come and will cost us more and more money, which again, why the roads review was important, to put more money into main, maintenance uh, and adaptation. Josh Finch so does. Uh, <coughs> Deputy Lewis. Um, as a result of the climatic changes and inclement weather, we've seen in the Conway Valley in the year to December 23, 178 trains cancelled. Out of the cancellations, 36 were due to unit shortages, while some, the other 142 were due to flooding. The A470 trunk road in the Conway Valley is often subject to closure as a result of frequent heavy rainfall. Now, it used, used to be when you had a serious flood. Now, heavy, frequent rainfall can actually cause real problems on that road. Uh, the section between Talacavan and Llan Roost is often shut due to floods and uh, water bursts. In fact, in the last 24 hours, we've seen the road completely blocked off at Maynham, um, so people can't get through now to the Conway Valley or to say Clan Roost, as a result of heavy rainfall and flooding on the road. Um, I have spoken previously about the need for us to improve the safety and resilience of transport infrastructure in the Conway Valley, but we are still hoping for some to come forward. What assurances can you give the residents of Aberconway that Transport for Wales and the North and Mid Wales Trunk Road agents will work and with our local authority, ERF department, to improve the resilience of the railway line and the A470 in the Conway Valley. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the uh, rightly points out the range of impacts we're seeing already from uh, man-made climate change, which is why we are taking action to tackle it. And I would say again, uh, I welcome the support on the Conservative benches for reaching uh, a net zero target and for going faster. But they also have to follow through then on the projects that flow from that to actually tackle the problem at source. And so far, every time we've brought forward action to tackle climate change, they've opposed it. Now, there is, you know, those two things stand in direct contradiction with each other. So she is absolutely right to be concerned and alarmed about the impact on our communities from uh, the uh, more unpredictable weather. And last year was the hottest uh, year on record, and this is only going to get worse. But we have together to muster the will to tackle this, rather than just mopping up the problem uh, after it's been. We are, uh, later this year, publishing a, a new uh, national climate resilience strategy, uh, and uh, we are looking at bids currently of the Roads Resilience Fund, and this is going to be an increasingly important issue in the future. Time, Thomas. Um, seeing more landslides, subsidence, stones and rocks appearing on rides and, and potholes growing. Um, really concer concerned about the resilience of the local network. There used to be grant funding for locally maintained roads, which has which stopped. And I know one authority who has no funding left this financial year to, to fill potholes, basically. So they're waiting until April before they can continue. It's, it's so dire. Um, I, was, there's, there's, I know there's competing um, funding for pressures for capital um, resources, for schools, for housing. So highways are usually the last on the list to get funded. So I'd like to ask you, Deputy Minister, do you think we need to have a, um, a basic limit so that we can keep maintaining our roads? And also, um, do you agree that landowners also need to take responsibility for their ditches and drains to ensure that they don't actually drain onto the highways as well going forward? Yes, the pressure is there on all transport networks, road, rail uh, and active travel. And as I said, it's going to get more uh, intense. We do have funding for the Resilient Roads Fund. And I think this is going to be increasingly an important part of the way that we are dealing with uh, climate change. Uh, and as I said, in, over time, uh, by redirecting funding from new roads that we don't maintain, we need to spend more on maintaining the roads we have and adapting the infrastructure to cope. And a good example of that uh, recently was the new um, Davy Bridge, uh, just north of Machanchieth, where, uh, as a result of the assessment of flooding, uh, the viaduct design was made longer. So that's now a key part of our thinking as we design new schemes. But she is right, there's a range of responsibilities for this. And maintenance uh, has never been a terribly 
sexy issue, as she points out, and all of us need to understand that more money needs to be directed towards that. How is the government ensuring that it fulfils its commitments to Wales becoming carbon neutral? Uh, thank you. Wales has a target of reaching net zero by 2050. Net zero is more ambitious than carbon neutrality. Our target is supported by interim targets and carbon budgets, which this and future governments must adhere to. The plan for the current carbon budget, Net Zero Wales, was published in 2021. In light of the stage three debate we had yesterday and also uh, a petition that was discussed in Petitions Committee on Monday, I want to get your views on the balance between large-scale solar developments and SSSI sites. What protections are there now in the new bill uh, as amended yesterday? And talking to the petitioners uh, against the development on the Gwent levels, there were two other things that, I, uh, that were raised with the committee chair, Jack Sargent, and myself. Could you confirm when you will publish the guidance on Chapter 6 of the New Wales Planning Policy? And when will you also publish the post-construction monitoring study that I believe is ready, well, I'm led to believe is ready for publication? Very excellent question. And it, there is always, isn't there, a balance to be struck between protecting designated landscapes of all sorts, whether they're triple SIs or we have several other designations, obviously, as well, and getting the renewables that we want and the, and the infrastructure that we want in Wales. I think we have got to strike that balance in a very... Um, judicious way. So we have actually very recently, as uh, a Senev, um, through our um, strengthening of the SI that uh, governs designated landscapes, um, strengthened the protection for designated landscapes against any development at all. As one of the things I said during that debate was that I thought it was um, very much the case that if you stopped Mr and Mrs Jones someplace in Wales and asked them whether you could pave something in a designated landscape, they would be astonished to find that you, in fact, could. Um, so we've very much strengthened that as a Senate. That, that went through uh, unanimously, and I'm very pleased to say that. Um, and that's about trying to find the right balance between what's allowed and what isn't allowed in a designated landscape. A solar farm is a com complex issue there, because solar farms are generally regarded as not permanent, um, because they are um, less than 50 years, usually, as, as the length of the solar farm. Now, I think 50 years is quite permanent. It will certainly see me out. So, you know, that's quite permanent from my point of view. But you can design a solar farm, and I have seen several examples of this around Wales, so that it's very high up off the ground, that it has pivoting panels, it's surrounded by trees or other protected landscapes, not necessarily trees, peatland or whatever, and actually has a pretty species risk meadow underneath it, for example. So it's hard to answer your question very specifically because it sort of depends on the type of solar farm we're talking about, the, the structure that's there, and all of the things. But I obviously can't comment on individual planning applications for obvious reasons. But we have been encouraging um, the solar farm industry in particular to design their solar farms in a way that means that if they are on land, I mean, on roofs of buildings is also excellent, but uh, if they are on land, that that land is not neutralised in any way, that it's actually... Um, able to support, you know, other things. Um, and that can be anything from grazing to flower-rich meadows I've seen. I've seen all kinds of things under them. Uh, you do, however, still see solar farms that are so close to the ground that they've pretty much, you know, killed the land underneath. That's probably not quite the right word, but, you know, they've, they've made it much harder to have it as, a, a, as producing anything at all. We have been actively discouraging that as a, as a design, and that's already in Planning Policy Wales. We keep all planning policy under review, and in particular, we try to keep it under review for emerging technologies. And so, as I understand it, I'm no expert in this, but as I understand it, the design of solar panels is becoming, uh, it's much easier to make them tilt towards the sun all the time, for example, and therefore the land underneath isn't permanently shaded, and so on. So, I, I can't answer your question about specific designated landscapes, but I can tell you those three things. We've strengthened the guidance. We work with the solar farm operators to try and get the best of design, and Planning Policy Wells already has a large number of those things, though we keep it under review all the time. Mike Hedges. Uh, thank you, Deputy Planning Officer. Um, um, how is building more gas power powered power stations, as suggested by the Conservative of Westminster, going to help us towards car the carbon neutral target? <laughs> we are seeing climate change affecting our weather continually. Does the Minister agree on how important the Swansea Tidal Lagoon is? 
And will the Minister continue to press for a Swansea Tiger Lagoon to be built as we discover that gas gets more and more expensive with time? Oh, well, I mean, quite clearly, uh, Mike, I absolutely agree with you that building gas power uh, fire stations doesn't contribute to anything at all other than increased climate change and uh, increased heating. Uh, we've just seen year on year, really, really quite scarily, we've just seen each year be hotter than the year.